So this morning I was gathered around the breakfast table with my son and I'm trying to teach him about the finer things of life. And he's really into superheroes right now. Um, specifically two-year-old superheroes, you know, like PJ Mask and Paw Patrol. So I, I'm, I'm talking to him about Batman. So I'm excited because I'm like, this is a superhero I know. And so I started to teach him the Batman theme song. So I said, here's how it goes, buddy. I said, it goes, na 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 Batman, Batman. I said, there's two Batmans. And so you got to say it twice. And so I could see it kind of computing in his head. And so he was like, okay, I got it, I got it. So I said, okay, let's do it together. So I said, na 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 And I pointed to him and he goes, Batmans with like an S at the end. <laughs> and I could see like, okay, he didn't quite grasp what I was trying to tell him. I was trying to tell him, you gotta say Batman twice. But in his head, he was saying, oh, well, there's, there's two Batmans. And so I don't say Batman, I say Batmans. Um, he's grasping this idea of plurality. And I, I think in this culture today, we really are, are struggling with plurality. Uh, especially in the religious scene. There are so many choices. There's more than one, right? And we're really trying to figure out our language around what we do with all the religions, all the worldviews that are present today, and how we can have mutual love and mutual respect. And we're really struggling with it as a culture. Um, pluralism is this idea that there's more than one. It's this idea that there is more than one religion that's out there. And in fact, sociologist uh, Peter Berger, he's done a lot of work around this. And basically what he says is that pluralism is one of the great um, issues that religion has today. Uh, and and it's, it's this idea that we live in a globalized society. We live in a culture right now where there are people from around the world that have very different beliefs than you. There are people from around the world that have very different religions and they're living side by side together in the same space as one another. And so what do we do about that? And it kind of feels unkind to the world when we say that, you know, as a Christian, that I have the worldview, that I have the truth. And for a lot of people, they think, man, that's really unkind and unloving. And so there's this pressure in our society that asks Christians to cave in on what they believe in order to make space for everybody else and everybody else's belief. And, and it, I don't think it's just Christians, I think it's every worldview. We don't like the idea of exclusivity. We wanna be inclusive of everybody and every idea and every thought. And so I just wanna take a quick pause and just say that's really awesome. Like, I think it comes from a great place. It comes from a place of compassion. It comes from a place of kindness. But I think that there are unintended consequences of that type of thinking. And really it has unintended consequences on religion. It changes everything about religion. There's a path forward for us in this discussion that involves compassion and kindness and love and mutual respect, even though we have very different beliefs. I think that I can live next to somebody who doesn't believe the same things as me, and I can love them genuinely and have respect for them and treat them with kindness because that's what Jesus did. He embodied that. I mean, he, he lived a very different life from a lot of the people that he hung out with, yet he still cared for them and he still loved them and he still treated them well. There is a path forward uh, that's very different than the religious seed that we see today. And I, I think that's important to say because there are very unintended consequences um, to the way that we are, are approaching religion and this pluralistic society. Now, I, I want you to think about the things that I'm about to say. And I want you, as I'm saying these things, to, to start to think about where pluralism plays into these phrases that I'm gonna tell you. Now, these phrases are phrases that you would commonly hear in our culture in regards to religion. Um, people might say things like, there's no way that you could believe that your religion is true for everyone. People might say things like, Christianity is too exclusive, or all religions are essentially the same thing. They teach the same things. Um, all roads lead to heaven, all paths lead to God. Every religion is just as valid as every other religion. We say these things all the time. And again, comes out of heart, a heart of compassion. Here's what pluralism has done to religion. It's robbed religion of all of its 
power. It's robbed religion of all of its stabilizing power, of all of its peace-giving power. Because if you cannot make the claim that your religion is true for all people, if you take religion and you firmly put it in the place of just personal opinion, what you've done is you've taken religion out of the world of objective facts and placed it into a world of personal opinion and personal preference. And so religion nowadays is not the search for truth. It's not the search for absolute truth. It's not the search for the story of, of humanity. But what it's become is the search for what works. It's become the search for um, what's good for you. And uh, if we have a faith like that, it, it creates a lot of problems with us because a faith like that, it can't give me stability. A faith like that, it can't give me peace because honestly, there's gonna be this underlying tension inside of me because I know that I'm just lying to myself. If I don't believe that my truth is true for all people, then how can it be truth? It's only truth for me. And if it's just truth for me, it's just a delusion that I'm telling myself to keep myself happy. And if that's the case, it can't bring me any stability. It can't bring me any peace. So what I wanna do today is I wanna deconstruct some of the assumptions that our culture brings to religion. And I want to give you some alternative ideas uh, that will help us frame this discussion about God in the middle of all of these world religions. Okay, so the first thing that I want to say is that in the world of religion, there is no such thing as your truth. Uh, there's just truth. And I think where this comes from is there's a, a confusion in our culture between objective truth and subjective truth. Here's what subjective truth is. Subjective truth is truth um, that's based upon your opinion and the validity of that truth is housed inside of the world of your opinion. Objective truth is truth that's outside of your opinion and the validity of that truth is housed outside of the world of your opinion. So um, when you say something like, I like soda, well that's a subjective truth because it's based upon your opinion. Is it a true statement? Absolutely. You probably do love soda. It's delicious. <laughs> but there's no way for us to verify that because the validity of that statement is, is housed inside of your specific opinion. Now, when you say something like God exists, what you're doing is you're making an objective truth claim. And an objective truth claim isn't swayed by your opinion. And the validity of that truth claim is not housed inside of your opinion. It's housed outside of your opinion. So what that means is, whether you believe it or not, it doesn't change the facts. The fact is, either God exists or He doesn't exist. Now, this changes the way that we approach God. Uh, if we approach God as a subjective truth claim, then, you know, facts really wouldn't matter. Really, all that would matter would be the content of religion. And does it feel right? Does it resonate with your heart? But the idea that God exists and the idea that there is a specific God is an objective truth claim. So let's take the greatest miracle of Jesus, his resurrection. The Bible claims that he died and he came back to life. And this is a religious claim. So how do we approach this religious claim? Well, it's an objective truth claim. It's outside of our opinion. And so it would be improper for us to consult our opinions about the resurrection of Jesus. What we have to do is actually consult the evidence about this resurrection story because it's an event and it can be verified by history and by evidence. And so it's important for us to consult the evidence. So our truth doesn't matter. It's what is the truth. That's what we have to search for. Okay, thought number two, not all religions are essentially the same. I think a lot of people say this, all religions are essentially the same, but like we know this is intellectually dishonest. We know that that's not true because I'm a Christian, but my religion is very different from Satanism. Very different, wildly different. Now, if you take the great world religions, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and you look at their moral teachings, yeah, a lot of them are pretty much the same. You know, treat people well, treat people kindly. And if you look at them, a lot of their teachings morally are the same. However, they vary wildly on the topics of who God is. Is there an afterlife? What does that afterlife look like? What's the nature of man? How does man interact with God? You know, there are a ton of things that these religions differ on. So to, to say that they're essentially the same is not true at all, and it can't be true. Mm -hmm. 
Not all religions are equally true. I think there's this pressure in our culture to say that all roads lead to heaven, that every religion is equally as valid. But to be honest with you, that violates some laws of logic that we all know to be true. One of those is the law of non-contradiction, which basically states that two people that make contradictory claims about the same event can't both be true, can't both be right. So Christians, uh, they claim that Jesus, Jesus resurrected from the dead, and Jewish people believe that Jesus didn't. One of them's right, and one of them's wrong. We can't both be right. And so either Jesus rose from the dead and Christians are right, or Jesus didn't, and Jewish people are right. So in this case, one religion is more true than the other, and we have to admit that. One road is more true than another. And then the last thing that I want to address is this idea that everybody has a version of truth. And so what we can do is just piece together every version of truth and come to this ultimate version of truth that's found in each and every religion. Well, um, this is kind of this idea that no one can make absolute truth claims, that every religion has their own little piece of truth, and that's their contribution to the religious world. Um, you know, there's an illustration that describes this, and I, I first heard it from Tim Keller, but it's basically this illustration that there are three blind men, and uh, they come up to an elephant, and they can't see the elephant, and so they don't know what it looks like, but each one is touching the elephant in, in a different uh, place. And so one of the people says, wow, well, the elephant, it's big, like a tree trunk, and it's, it's coarse, it's, it's harsh. And then another guy says, well, actually, an elephant moves like a snake because he's grabbing the trunk. And then uh, another person says, no, an elephant is not like that. An elephant is, is wavy and it's thin because they're grabbing the ear. Now, each one of them is right in their own way because they're feeling a different part of the elephant. And when you put them all together, you get a greater picture. Now, this is kind of this claim that you can't know absolute truth, that there is no way to know what the entire picture looks like. However, there is one person in this picture that knows what absolute truth is, and that's the person that claims that you can't know absolute truth. And so what we find is that this claim is actually self-contradicting. It's basically saying we can't know absolute truth, but that's an absolute truth claim, that no one can know absolute truth. Okay, so in this pluralistic world, how do we choose? How do we pick a religion? Because I think it's pretty clear from today's teaching that they can't all be right, that they can't all be true, and uh, it's not really that logical to think that each of them contains their own version of truth. So what do we do? Well, here's what we do. We treat them like the objective truth claims that they are. And objective truth claims can be measured. Uh, they can be evaluated. We can look at evidence. And one of the things that I love about Jesus and about Christianity is it's a faith that's based upon evidence. Jesus was never afraid of providing evidence for his claims uh, to himself. I mean, he provided miracles that were proofs that he truly was who he said he was. And when people had questions, people like Thomas, Jesus said, hey, come and feel my wounds. He said, come and, and, and see for yourself. Come and, and check out the evidence. And what I love about Christianity is it was born into a world where there was written communication, where we have historical evidence that we can look at that can help provide us an understanding of whether this truth claim was all that Jesus said it was or whether it was a lie.